Welcome everybody to the segment of this AI and data science for COVID-19 lecture series. And today we have a panel discussion uh, where the topic will be uh, you know, responding to global crises, age of data and information overload. I'll introduce the panelists uh, in a minute. Just wanted to give you a quick overview of uh, the house rules first. So as always, uh, you know, as an attendee, when you join the event, your microphones are muted and only the host can unmute them. Uh, we strongly ask, I encourage you to ask questions by typing them in the Q&A window on the right hand side. And periodically, you know, uh, uh, in the session, uh, we'll pause uh, and ask, take those questions. Uh, but because this is a panel, we'll also take lots of questions in the end. So I hope you have uh you know feel free to uh, answer uh ask any questions you like uh, so you know so far we've had uh six lectures uh and they've ranged from data visualization to modeling to information overload i mean just gave you a breadth of the work that uh takes place at qcri uh and of course you know people in researchers in qcri work in different areas but they were able to pivot some of their research to respond to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and then and uh, and this this panel will sort of continue uh, that sort of discussion, some thoughts regarding that. So just to give you a, a quick overview of the panelists, so uh, you know Dr. Kareem Darwish, who's a principal scientist and acting director of ALT, the Arab Language Technologies Group, uh, will be here. Dr. Preslav Nakov. He presented earlier. He's a principal scientist at QCRI. Dr. Ahmed El Magamed is uh, executive director of QCRI. Dr. Fazal Furu leads our, our health initiative, the principal scientist. And Dr. Ashraf Abul Naga is a senior research director at QCRI. And he was also coordinating all our COVID 19 efforts uh, in, uh, in the last two months. So, just want to uh, just set the stage uh, for the discussion. Uh, so the way I see it is, you know, this pandemic is a triangle in, in there's three corners, you know, there's health and science, there's economics, and there's politics. And uh, it's, you know, but our, our focus will primarily will be on uh, this segment on health and science and on the economics impact, uh, economic impact of the pandemic. Uh, our expertise, of course, is in the science part. Uh, we also have expertise in digital health. So, um, you know, so we'll try and keep the focus on on these two corners of the triangle. Uh, of course, all these things are very interrelated. So we just had a, just to give you some insight about that. So this is the Google search trends of, of four terms of virus, symptoms, Trump and unemployment. Uh, and you can see uh, how these uh, trends, these search trends have evolved. Uh, the blue one is, is the virus, so it really peaked around March. And then not just below that is, uh, is the symptoms. And of course, there's politics and there's unemployment, which is economics. So this was in the US. And uh, surprisingly, the trend in Qatar uh, has at least some commonality. Uh, so this is the trend in Qatar, which is again, you can see the two peaks of the search virus and of course, uh, on symptoms. So uh, there has not been much, uh, uh, you know, it's not much search on unemployment. But one, th one interesting thing to notice here is that the red one, which is about symptoms, you know, there's a slight uptick during the last week. So people seem like are searching more for symptoms or maybe indicates that uh, you know people are getting concerned about the epidemic in in, in Qatar. So with that, I, I want to uh, set the stage by I want to sort of ask start asking questions. Uh, and the first question I have, and I'll just after asking the question, I'll basically just go around and just for people to comment on it. So uh, the so the official timeline of the WHO web page has this very sort of innocuous statement on March 11th, uh, deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity 
and the alarming levels of inaction, WHO made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Since all, since all of you uh, are experts in AI and computer science, uh, I just want to ask, start with like a sort of a general uh, question about what has your thoughts been about the pandemic, how it has evolved, and how AI and computer science are playing a role in it. Maybe I'll start with uh, Preslav. Preslav, do you wanna say something about that? I'll stop sharing so you are- uh... yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, so um, that's a great statement. Um, actually, earlier than that, on February 15th, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization started talking about fighting not just an epidemic, but also fighting an infodemic. So, and if you look at the, um, people started talking, and this is something that happens in the World Health Organization level, at the United Nations level, people started talking about fighting not only the, the first global pandemic, okay, sorry, not the first global pandemic, but a global pandemic, they have been other global pandemics earlier, like the Spanish flu about the 100 years ago, but also fighting the first global infodemic. And if you look at the top five lists of priorities of the World Health Organization, so fighting the infodemic, that is information related to the pandemic is ranked at number two in the top five list. And it's a very interesting phenomenon because it mixes together health disinformation, but also political conspiracies, uh, things about anti-vaxxers are back, 5G is there, Bill Gates and so on. Um, and it's not only about conspiracies, it's also about fake cures, spreading panic, xenophobic racism, prejudices, blaming the authorities and things like that. And the thing is that people are not really immune, right? Uh, it's not like just in the old times you had the flat earthers, which are kind of ridiculous, but when you have a new topic, people don't really quite understand it and it's easy for them to fall in this trap. Um, and, and I see the, the kind of the role of AI, you know, quite important in fighting this infodemic. Um, we have been work, doing some work in the Qatar Computing Research Institute. We have been developing a platform to model the perspective of journalists, fact checkers, social media platforms, policy makers, and the society as a whole um, as part of those global efforts. So um, obviously I see the things from my own research viewpoint. Uh, we have quite a substantial research effort in the Qatar Computing Research Institute on fighting disinformation as part of the TMB project, which I, I, I talked about uh, at the previous uh, presentation. And it's to me, one of the big news is that this is emerging as an important topic. And I believe AI has a lot to offer in this respect. Yeah, that's great. Uh, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, to, to add to it, um, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll mostly talk about in terms of preparedness, what this pandemic has actually you know, shown us is that more, more than ever, there's, there's need for uh, real need for two things. Um, uh, in general, uh, you know, it's, uh, some sort of uh, you know, data exchange platforms where, where data can be seamlessly exchanged and, and readily exchanged. Um, I, I think we, you know, as a as a computer science community, we have come far in terms of the technologies we have developed, but this is an area where uh, where we're, we're we're still lacking a lot. Uh, we, we should have been able to make a lot more advancements in this. Um, people are still struggling for, uh, in terms of getting access to data, getting access to quality data. People are still try, struggling to make decisions just because of the data, um, uh, you know, la lack of data or lack of uh, lack of good data. So, so more than ever, um, you know, if if AI, data science, computer science, any of this has to be more useful. Uh, if any of this has to, you know, be more prevalent and, uh, uh, you know, and and sort of embedded within uh, within the response that we have for these pandemics or or, or in general for for any crisis, uh, we need to have a, a strong support system, strong infrastructure that that at a government level or at at, at a public policy level. Need, needs to be mandated. Uh, so, so more more than ever, um, you know, the the need for these data exchanges, health data exchanges, and uh, is um, is is uh, has has come up as more important. And as as Presla was talking about, there is a parallel uh, world out there where 
um, were data generated and consumed at alarming high rates and a lot of it could be uh, you know a lot of it could be fake a lot of it could be just opinion a lot of it could be just you know something that's that may not be you cannot use to drive policies whereas on the other hand where we are generating a lot of data but there isn't a seamless mechanism to be able to access it so i i, I think that's that's extremely important that has come up with during this pandemic uh, that in terms of preparedness, we need, we need to account for in the future. Yeah, great. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, do you have something to add or? Well, um, so first of all, let me, uh, on behalf of uh, all of uh, us at HBKU, at Qatar Foundation uh, and at QCRI, thank uh, Sanjay for this initiative to organize these seven lectures. I think this is uh, proven to be very informative and, uh, and the format also uh, was uh, very healthy for open discussion and, uh, and, 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 and uh, so on. So I want to thank uh, Sanjay. I want to thank all the speakers and all of our colleagues at uh, QCRI and otherwise that have participated. This has been uh, tremendously successful. We've had over a hundred attendees in every one of these six talks, which I, I didn't expect, you know, to have uh, that number. And also, we've had people that stayed for an average of an hour and fifteen minutes uh, or more uh, on these uh, sessions. So, going back to the topic, I think that uh, um, uh, uh, Preslav and uh, Faisal have both uh, touched on two very important things. First of all. Uh, if I may, there is this sort of peculiar period that we're going through, right? So typically we're used to science being done in the lab and um, us uh, laymen hear about it when there is some interesting results. And usually that debate takes place in, med in, uh, in scientific journals and in the labs. Uh, the peculiar thing in this first pandemic in the information age is that the debate is taking place in public, right? So now we have citizen scientists that are commenting on cures and vaccines and uh, findings. Uh, sometimes before we even um, uh, hear the rebuttals from the science, sci from the scientific community and from the review process. So this is very odd. And then what Preslav mentioned is that there's this confluence. I, I see this triangle between politics and science and public opinion. Um, uh, so by public opinion, I mean uh, uh, citizens uh, getting involved, getting engaged, uh, demanding cures, demanding uh, to know uh, the statistics, demanding to know the numbers. And the politicians now are uh, uh, very much weighing in. And, uh, and uh, I'm surprised that in your uh, survey of Qatar, uh, in, I mean, in, in your Google uh, trace of Qatar, you also looked at Trump. I don't know what's Trump's relevance uh, within uh, Qatar, but but just to show you that uh, uh, politics has played has uh, has uh, played a role, and I believe this led to dumbifying the science. So I believe the scientists had to prematurely dumbify what they're doing in order for the laymen uh, 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 like us to be able to understand and follow what's going on. The whole debate of chloroquine and Demisevir and so on, typically in a typical uh, uh, age, would be part of the public uh, discourse much, much later. And now it is happening while the scientists haven't uh, 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 determined. So this is one thing that I, want to, that I want to mention. The other thing that bothers me specifically, and I think that uh, Faisal mentioned it, but not directly, I think he's being polite, and uh, uh, and there is technology adoption. I see that um, despite of our best intentions, that we typically, as techies, we tend to first develop a technology and then look for uses for this technology. Well, fortunately, in this case, QCRI has played a big part in 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 doing all kinds of developments, starting with the with the um, um, screening app that has been used by 
almost one and a half million people. At least the last time I looked at statistics, it was over 1.3 million people that have used the app in 11 languages to the uh, contact tracing work that we did in the very first two months of the uh, outbreak in Qatar jointly with the National Command Center uh, to have a team there to do contact tracing, you know, uh, 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 automatically. And then now to the geofencing application to the uh, other contact tracing application to the mobility analysis uh, 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 development and so on. The one thing is that I find that despite the fact that we work closely with the end users, that the adoption is not necessary at the end of the day, the, the, the sort of like the impact, uh, uh, it, not necessarily where it should be. And I ask myself, say, for example, why is all contact tracing or most of contact tracing in China done uh, automated using uh, uh, apps and, uh, and, 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 and this sort of uh, perve uh, 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 perverence uh, of uh, 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 penetration of, of people using these apps and so on is much higher than it is here. And then in reading, I realized that, say, for example, in New York, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, they they were very proud that they hired and they trained 300 contact tracers. So so there is this sort of uh, uh, gap between technology and uh, not only adapting it, but having it really make an impact, especially in the middle of an emergency, right? Especially while, uh, so you, you, you've you got the healthcare, the, the public healthcare uh, 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 officials running, you know, 100 miles an hour, trying to deal with this uh, outbreak, with this emergency, with life and death situations, and you are handing them a technology that's new to them, that's new to us, that's been, you know. So, so we have to, as a technologist and, a, and as computer scientists, we have to go after this is over. We have to step back and see how we develop and how we introduce new technology. And this is an area that's close and, and dear to Faisal's heart. He's been doing this. He did that at Siemens. He did that at IBM. And so on, and he's now doing it here, working with his colleagues at HMC and MOPH and Cornell, and so on. So we, we, I, I, I look forward to hearing from uh, uh, Faisal about technology adapt, uh, adoption, and uh, and how can that be done more successfully? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Sanjay. Great, great. So Ashraf, uh, yeah, please, uh, you know, add something to it. Also, you know, Ashraf is leading the. Or coordinating all the COVID nineteen efforts, uh, you know, through the Q from QCRI with the government and uh, you know, external uh, agencies. So, uh, Ashraf, over to you. So, thank you, Sanjay, and good morning, everybody. Uh, to echo what uh, uh, Preslav, uh, Faisal, and Ahmed said, this is definitely a pandemic where data plays a central role in terms of informing public opinion and informing decision makers. Uh, and we at QCRI, as you know, are very good at uh, data analysis and data science. So we had a lot of effort to help the country dealing with the pandemic. And Ahmed already mentioned a couple of uh, these efforts like contact tracing. And uh, uh, also, uh, Preslav mentioned the, the, so the, the media analytics. We also have social media analytics where we basically measure the public sentiment around the the a pandemic, we look at the rumors emerging in Arabic and English and Qatar worldwide, and we create reports and share with decision makers. An important uh, aspect of this pandemic is the, of this pandemic is the importance of reducing contact of social distancing. And there we need to study mobility. And we need to study mobility at the aggregate level by creating reports. And I think uh, in this lecture series, we saw uh, some of the dashboards that we created and some of the analysis that we do in terms of the amount of reduction of mobility in, in, in the country. But then there's also mobility at the individual level, like, for example, making sure that people are still quarantined in uh, who are quarantined, do not break the quarantine or uh, contact tracing, which do with National Command Center, as Ahmed mentioned. So in all of these cases, we, we at QCRI have efforts and the, the general overarching comment is that data and technology and AI definitely play and will continue to play an important role in managing this pandemic. 
good. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, if you have, so let me uh, ask the next question. Uh, if you can see my slide. Okay. Uh, one second. Can you see my slides or? No? You see your face. You see my face. Okay, one second. Uh, let me just share again. Now you can see it, I guess. Yes. So uh, just, you know, um, one thing that's come up is about lockdown, right? Like two months into the pandemic, do you think the lockdown has been the right instrument for dealing with it? And so, and can AI you know, help come up with the right mix of policy measures to deal with the pandemic? And maybe for the second wave, you know, that people are predicting there'll be a second wave. For example, there's the South Korea model, and there's the Sweden model, and there's the China model. Uh, so why do you think most countries have gone down with the lockdown approach? And, you know, it's, people say it's a very blunt instrument. Um, any thoughts on that or? Um, so, I mean, I just to just to get started, and I think that uh, that others will have much more more specific and substance to say. I think that this is, in my opinion, it helped the healthcare system uh, keep up with the problem. I, I don't I'm not necessarily certain that uh, lockdown eliminated the problem, but it just sort of it made you control the the degree by which uh, 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 the numbers got into the critical. Or, or the the stage where by which they need hospitalization, so that the healthcare system can keep up with it. And I think this is what we've done extremely well in Qatar. If you look uh, at the number of people that are uh, needing hospitalization, are under four percent of the total cases. The people that are needing ICU is under one percent of total cases. And 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 playing with this to make sure that your health. Play the role. I am not sure that it. Uh, at the end of the day, it uh, the num uh, X number of people will get uh, infected and they will get infected. But I, you know, I mean, uh, 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 Faisal would know much more about that. But, but do you think the lockdown, uh, uh, sorry, AI could have helped? You know, so isn't lockdown too blunt? And you know, we could have yeah, yeah, used I, AI I, better to. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. I think AI. Could help us, and perhaps it helped us. Uh, like, for example, the Google app uh, and and our work on mobility in in looking at, say, for example, uh, is clue, uh, school closing uh, is it effective or not? Does it contribute to reducing uh, uh, the infection rate? Uh, 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 is, for example, uh, 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 work from home? That is, in in other words, a lockdown is too broad. And AI allows you to break it down into segments, break, uh, for example, lockdown parks or public places or shopping or malls, you know, workplaces, schools and so on and so forth. I think this is where uh, AI and models and so on let you uh, 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 play with it. Sorry, guys. Sorry. I guess if I can uh, just chime in here quickly. So one of the problems that uh, that we have with AI is that we need data. And at the beginning of the pandemic, no one really, really had data. So would school closure make a difference or not? Uh, if we close uh, restaurants, like what happened here, uh, would it really contribute at the end or not? And one of the things I think that that was seen from the mobility reports is that if you close enough, uh, you know, restaurants, then there is higher, you know, demand on some other ones. And now we have you get congestion points, so there's kind of the uh, of, I mean you have unintended consequences sometimes when you take uh, decisions like this, and collecting data I mean lots and lots of data as much as you can is is kind of the only way that you can actually uh, have AI eff be effective in actually measuring the, uh, the 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 effectiveness or the efficacy of the decisions that were taken. And it needs to be to have you know decision makers who are flexible enough that you know they take a decision, then we start measuring. Then after we measure, we say, oh, okay, this is the unintended consequence. 
how can we manipulate the uh, the decision a little bit more or or fine tune it to make sure that these things don't happen in the future. So this is on one side, and on the other side, I mean, you mentioned the issue of uh, China and uh, and lockdowns and so forth, and I think Faisal can speak a lot more to to this. So I mean, apart, I mean, we have to understand that that part of the lockdowns and and these measures has have been taken to kind of buy time for uh, for authorities, because no one at the beginning knew, okay, what's what's the fatality rate from this? How quickly does it spread? Uh, what kind of measures do we have? Uh, do we have enough capacity or not? Like in the case of the U.S., they thought that the you know like New York said they knew they needed thirty thousand ventilators. They ended up using far fewer from that because you know how the how the, the you know the uh, the usage played out at the end. It turns out that the fatality rate was such that they didn't actually need them. So at the beginning, no when no one really knows, everybody wants to be you know to err on the side of safety until we have data, and then we retroactively now look at the data and say, okay, now that we have data, what would be the best uh, you know uh, path to move forward given this data? So, so yeah, yeah, I think this is interesting. We we'll come back to it. Uh, Fezel, do you want to say something about the lockdown and maybe it could be more fine grained or so choice or yeah, sure. So so uh, you know uh, during my presentation, I'm uh, I sort of alluded to how and why people actually took this all or none approach. You know, there is it was really the lack of preparedness. People didn't have enough data to make decisions on. So. So, in, you know, as Kareem said, everyone sort of erred on the side of caution and said, we, we can't have our health systems uh, be overwhelmed. Um, so we'll, we'll just, we'll just go with the lockdown. The, the, you know, there was hardly any information about the pandemic itself. And more importantly, you know, which is expected, you know, not having a lot of information about the pandemic in the early stages, but you know, what was, what was unfortunate uh, was that the things that we should have had information about we didn't have a lot of information just just to give an example you know and in fact i alluded this, uh, to this during my le lecture as well in sweden uh, the icu registry would could be updated every 30 minutes for the entire country right whereas on the other hand some place like new york one hospital in flushing was is overwhelmed has ICU patients outside on the street because they they can't get even inside the hospital the people that should be needing ICU whereas just few blocks down in other hospitals in Queens the beds are completely empty and and you know this led this led uh, uh, you know governor Cuomo actually said, we don't have a public health system in the US we have a sick care system basically anybody gets sick you know we will try to treat them we don't have a public health system so, you know, this is what led to this all or none approach because, you know, on one hand, you don't have information about the pandemic and which is expected. On the other hand, you don't even have information about what you have or what you should have, right? And that's really, you know, brought people on, on, on a wrong foot and, you know, they had to take, it, take an approach on either go complete lockdown or, or, or use the Sweden approach and hope for the best. And um, and then of course you know a lot of politics can play in. Nobody wants so many deaths on their hands. Nobody wants to be the wrong person to make the you know the person to make the wrong decision. So so that you know that whereas the, it, there could have been a much fine grained phase wise um, approach to shutdown that I alluded to it in in my in my lecture, which which sort of balance between the healthcare capacity, the economic impact, as well as the impact on social life. Preslav, do you? That's good. Preslav. So, uh, I I kind of agree with with uh, the previous kind of with uh, what uh, Dr. Ahmed and Faisal Karim have, have said uh, before me. So, I think that the lockdown is the right thing to do, especially when you don't have information. I mean, there's a reason why the China's approach was so radical. I mean, they were the very first to face it, and they just didn't want to take any chances. And they had the experience with um, other kinds of uh, coronaviruses in the past that had actually much higher fatality rate. Um, and, and they they recognized the, the problem and they, they moved very fast, very radical. Um, 
much earlier, after some, uh, much later, after some information has been gained, countries like Sweden can play, and early UK can experiment with, with kind of more rules, uh, measures, and, and, and can, can play with this. But in a situation where it's a new virus, there's no cure, there's no vaccine, there's no enough information, there's no preparation, I think that the lockdown, lockdown uh, was, was, was the right thing to do. The problem is that it's not really sustainable. So, um, and the next thing that you need to focus on is, <clears throat> I mean, what is next? Um, again, in Tambi, uh, which is an application that we are building here, here in QCRI uh, to, mo to monitor uh, the disinformation and so on, we are here looking not only into disinformation, but also the frame of reporting. Um, and the problem, the way that it was discussed in media was primarily from a health perspective. But over time, there have been other perspectives that started gaining uh, uh, kind of traction. People started worrying about the economy. So, and, and this is something that also governments worry, how do you, do you balance it and so on. So you want to reopen. And to reopen, you want things that have been uh, uh, discussed earlier. You need testing, you need contact tracing, you need tracing of mobility, of quarantine, you need to know what kind of measures work what don't and 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 this is obviously kind of where ai can help you in actually helping authorities make informed decisions um and obviously AI can help for other things like symptoms for cures and vaccines um it can also help for analyzing the literature and this is again something that you know uh, qcri has been uh, active on uh there was this white house initiative and by our institute for AI, it is something that is there as part of the reality project Okay, Ashraf, uh, I'll come back to this in a point again, but Ashraf, do you want to say something? Um, I think uh, the colleagues have already covered all the important points, which is uh, lockdown is, is the correct response in the beginning, but moving forward, you need to think about how you're going to lift it through testing, contact tracing, and quarantine. Some I feel that, uh, you know, at least in South Korea, it didn't have, it happened very quickly after uh, China and, and they, they never went to a lockdown mode and you know they, they did contact tracing and you know massive testing and, uh, and of course they had the they had the capability of doing this testing and contact tracing uh, because everything in, in south korea works you know they do all the shopping through the you know even all the payments are done through phones and so uh so there's more data and because you know uh, it seems like in you know the next pandemic we again will be short of data, right? It'll be a different pandemic. And we'll always have this, what's called the cold start problem, right? We'll, we'll have to wait to get data before we can react to it. And, and uh, you know, that's something that's uh, worth uh, thinking about. Anyway, so there's a couple of things. Quickly, just quickly, Sanjay, the, you know, as, as you mentioned South Korea again, you know, we, we have to understand one of the reasons South Korea was able to do what they were able to do was because they took their time and invested in the right things right after SARS. Because, you know, remember, SARS was, was their COVID-19. The way COVID-19 found the world unprepared, South Korea was exactly in the same situation when SARS hit them. So, so they learned from it and, and, and invested in all the right, almost all the right things to be able to ready for this. And then that's what I was mentioning that this is where the world needs to go. Great, that's excellent. So, if, yes. if I may add something. So um, um, obviously the Asian countries was, were much better prepared for that because of SARS, which is, uh, I mean, which is also a kind of coronavirus. Um, but I mean, there are national specifics. So for example, South Korea never went into lockdown. And initially this was a strategy of Singapore. I mean, about a month ago, we came to Singapore as an example, but eventually Singapore had to go into lockdown, right? Because they had a situation, they had a lot of foreign workers that were that were kind of packed into compounds where social distances was hard. And this is not the situation in Korea. So basically, I mean, we have to be careful when we are thinking of solutions that there's national specifics and that, you know, it's not that everything is universal. I mean, there are lessons to be learned, but there are also other factors that you need to take into account. Great. Okay, I'll take some questions from the, because there are quite a few questions now from the, from the attendees. So one is, uh, I guess we a little bit alluded to it, but I can ask the question again. 
Can you speak to how much the pandemic has exposed the fragile codependence in which changes to our behavior change how AI works and changes to how AI works changes our behavior? So the codependence between data, AI, and our sort of behavior. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's a good question. And any thoughts on that? I mean, I think- If I can, if I can just give a, a really quick thing. So, so one of the things that, that is well known in the literature is that uh, Google uh, had had an effect about, on how people actually search. So the natural way of searching, you know, I, I want to find, you know, how to do X, Y, and Z. But uh, when you actually go search for Google, uh, you know, you don't actually say that. You just say, you know, X, you know, Y, and maybe you put Z there and, and hope for the best, right? And, and so technology kind of um, uh, uh, shapes the way that we handle things. So it is actually a, a global phenomenon. So it's not just unique to this problem that we have now. Yeah. So, yeah, to, 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 quickly to add to it, you know, and, and, and um, most of us who work in machine learning know, know of this phenomenon of temporal drifts in, in, in distributions. And a lot of it is actually because of the fact that people start responding to, to, so, you know, you know, you're, you know, for example, you take buying behavior, your buying behavior changes because of the ads and promotions and everything else you see, then you bring seasonality in, you know, in terms of, you know, when, when there's holiday seasons and all of that, you know, as it impacts your buying behavior changes that starts the cycle all over again on when people should be uh, prompted with ads, when people should be. So, so this this is a well known phenomenon of you know, dis distribution dip, drift. You know, to give you an example, you know, uh, uh, Ahmed very early on talked about the mobility app. On you know how uh, how by when the pandemic started and there were lockdowns and you know people started looking a lot more on Google and you know which places are busy, which places are not busy. That started changing the way people started, uh, you know, going to grocery stores. You know, again, restaurants shut down. Grocery stores started getting packed. As, you know, as as Karim was Karim was talking about, which basically then meant is that 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 data is now no longer the baseline data that it used to be, right? So 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 yes, you know the the you know it, there's there's a lot of the cyclic relationship between how the data impacts us as, 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 a, as a people on our behavior, and then how that actually goes back into the system to create some, something new. So let, me, let me add something to this. Um, there, there have been, this, this again creates also credibility issues. And this is something that, that is a big problem for, for government and for scientists, because we have all these models, and obviously all models are wrong, some models are useful, this is something that we know from research, uh, but um, the problem is that you have some predictions, you have all these curves, and then there are interventions, there are things that, that, that are actually being made, and, and then things don't develop according to those, according to those predictions. Right, and and then people kind of some people say, well, I mean, those guys are lying to us. They they are not really having, they don't have a good understanding of how the disease is progressing and all that. But actually, the moment when you make an intervention, things change, and we are making all kinds of interventions in the, in in between. So it's it's a little bit of kind of the the problem of somebody trying to prevent uh, a disaster is that if you if you do not manage to prevent it. Boom. How come you couldn't, right? If you do, then it's like, why was all this noise? Why was all this kind of lockdown? Why did we destroy our economy, right? For nothing. See, nothing happened. Uh, and, and yeah, that, that's a big problem. In fact, there's a question related to that. You know, we are two months into the lockdown, and yet every day we hear over 1,000 new positive cases. I'm assuming or Qatar. How can AI predict this and whether it did or not? It sounds somehow that data analytics is at the receiving end rather than at the predicting front. I'm not sure. I guess this is more of a comment. Uh, a couple of more questions. Uh, why, are we, why are people picking and choosing the data they share? Uh, any, I guess I'm just reading what people are writing here. Uh, if anybody has a comment, please jump in. There's one, uh, another question is uh, related to Qatar. Is Qatar being premature in gradually trying to open up Example, opening up cafes, et cetera, or not providing enough surveillance. Is data not indicative that we are still going uphill in terms of daily positive cases and not even reached our peak? 
do we really need to test our ICU bed capacity? So any, any thoughts on that? Any comments on that? Well, well, uh, Sanjay, so I just want to say very, very high level comment before uh, Faisal uh, digs deep. Uh, uh, it's very important, and I think that uh, that uh, uh, folks at uh, MOPH and at the uh, at the uh, um, HMC and others have been very clear. It's very important to listen, uh, especially at this time, to listen to. Uh, uh, sanctioned uh, channels. For example, the comment that you said about opening, uh, there has been a lot of rumors on social media about uh, May 17 and May 18 and, uh, you know, this and that opening and so on. And in fact, it's not true. So I, I think it's very important uh, that folks listen to uh, the channels, whether it's the uh, uh, government communication office, whether it's the Qatar news agency, whether it's the the channels from the Ministry of Health, and, and they've been really very forthcoming with a lot of uh, data and information. Uh, I'm not I'm not talking about the question about the increased number of cases, but in terms of opening and not opening, what's going to happen? As far as I know, uh, the lockdown is still going, and as far as I know, masks are required when you step outside and so on. So it's very important to listen to the to the uh, 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 official uh, news channels. I mean, obviously, people will look at whatever they want, but it's very important at the end of the day to check whatever you find with with what's being released uh, 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 by authorities. Yeah, that that that's an that's an excellent point, um, Ahmed. So the so. You know, I, I, I want to go back to uh, one of the comments, and I think Sanjay, you you alluded to it in in uh, in uh, your lecture that you had with uh, Stefano and uh, and Saad. Um, so all, all of these, you know, predictions, they, they're, they're only models, right? You know, and and all models have assumptions that go into these models, right? Um, I want to tie it back to you know the 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 new rise rise in the new cases. So. When we're talking about AI or you know, these uh, predictive models predicting a certain trajectory, there are certain assumptions that go into, you know, for example, you know, what's the vulnerable population, uh, how much is our current isolation, how much is our expected isolation to be over the next few months, and all of these complicated models are then, you know, sort of solved, so equations are solved for a particular case. Uh, just, just to give you an example recently, you know, with the, with the very high uptick in, in our cases. A lot of the assumption of the uh, of the models were based on certain social contact, which was modeled because of what the lockdown situation we had. And all of the all of those assumptions got thrown out into the air because of uh, because of non-compliance. And and this this is actually something that the ministry is requesting all people now is in Ramadan there has been a lot more socialization than what was before it, which led to increase in social contacts and which led to in fact for almost 400% increase in cases amongst Qataris and res residents than the regular people that usually were, um, were getting infected. So, you know, as these assumptions change, of course, the models will have to change and the, and the result will be something, something different. So, so it's not more about being on the receiving end versus on the predicting front. It's the predictions have assumptions, and as soon as those assumptions start failing, and in this case, for example, the assumption on social contacts, which which failed because of the increase in socialization during Ramadan, uh, that the predictions change, and now we are looking at the peak being shifted. Correct. Good point. Yes. Yeah. So uh, another question, uh, Faisal. Again, this is uh, for you, I guess. Um, uh, uh, to what extent can AI has speed up drug discovery and development? I know it's a hard question. I just want to hear your thoughts. I guess so, you would be the best person to answer that, I guess. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, in, in, term, in terms of drug discovery, we have to understand um, that marketing of a drug, you know, is basically think of the end point, right? When a drug actually starts getting marketed, there's a huge process before that, you know, it's all the way starting from preclinical molecule, then you have animal testing, then you have phase one, phase two, phase three trials, then you have safety surveillance and, you know, marketing and then post-marketing marketing surveillance. 
So it's a very complicated, long process. What we have to understand is when we're talking about AI helping in drug discovery, where it's shortening the phase is basically in terms of candidate generation, specifically in, uh, in, in drug discovery. Whereas it used to take, you know, a lot of time in sometimes, you know, even years for generating candidates, you know, we recently uh, a lot of literature has been published on AI being able to generate candidates in, in weeks. So, so that is something where AI definitely is helping, but, you know, people should not think of, oh, now we'll have drugs in weeks because it's just candidate generation. It still has to go through. Lab, it actually has to go through the viability of the molecule, the lab testing, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, as well as you know the safety. Set. So all of that still has to be done. So we shouldn't expect that because of AI now we will have drugs coming out in weeks. We have candidates coming out in weeks, and that has shortened a lot of the time in in the discovery phase. But then you know it still has to go through the rest of the process. If I may say something also complementary there is on drug repurposing. I don't know if uh, Faisal forgot or he purposely uh, did not want to talk about drug repurposing. But this is another, another area where AI and automation can help uh, quite a bit. And I'm very proud of the work that uh, Raghavendra Mall and uh, Hussam Al Mir and Khaled Al Khinji and Mohammed Saad are doing in drug uh, repurposing. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and Ihsan, yes, yes, of yes. course, of course, he's the key there to making sure that uh, the software is working and, and, uh, and so, so, um, so that whole area relies on going through libraries of hundreds or thousands of drugs. And I believe that uh, uh, the competition that these folks entered the Kaggle uh, uh, competition and the fact that they, I, I, I don't know, I think if the result is out, they either won or placed high in that uh, competition um, is an indication of the potential of AI and the potential that QCRI has to contribute to, to uh, this uh, area. Great. I, I now want to move on to, uh, uh, oh, uh, Ashra, for uh, Kareem, do you have any thoughts in general on this or any of those questions or before I move to uh, the next? I have nothing. Okay. I'm good. So, uh, so the, the other question I had was, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, since the pandemic, you know, telemedicine, online education, work from home, of course, has seen a massive increase. So this will provide a huge data source for you know more fine grained understanding of you know medicine about education and work practices. So in some sense, you know if we have more data, more fine grained data. So, so you know, is this the has a golden age of AI arrived? Any any thoughts on that? So if I may interject here, I mean to with, with this question. So I guess some people will have this data. Uh, I, I know, for example, uh, people at Coursera and edX and so forth, they've been conducting many studies uh, over the past few years to understand how people use online education and uh, how long people are able to to uh, stick with it and and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I mean, with many of these things, it, it uh, it's, uh, and the AI to for it to work, as I mentioned earlier, needs data. And if uh, this information continues to stay in the hands of very few people, uh, then it might not be universally, uh, you know, uh, accessible or useful. I mean, one of the positive things now, now is that, you know, Ministry of Education, for example, has data on how people are submitting, you know, how students are submitting, how they're interacting and so forth. So that's good that they now have data that they didn't have before. And now people have, I mean, I guess more than having the data is people are now willing to venture and try things that they never thought to try before. Like, for example, the idea of homeschooling was completely off the table for, for you know, most people. Now it's becoming an issue that people are actually discussing, uh, working from home for, for prolonged periods of time. It was completely off the table. So there's kind of a mind shift, more than even data shift. So, uh, so I, I think this uh, pandemic, even though with all the negatives that it had, 
it had many positive aspects in, in, in ways where people started to think about things they never thought possible before. Exactly, yes. Yeah. I would say that uh, I would generalize instead of uh, the golden age of AI, I would say it's the golden age of uh, dependence on technology. If you think about uh, the lockdown, uh, it could not, uh, like, people would not have been able to survive without lots of technologies that came on, uh, that came on, uh, uh, maybe in the last 10, 15 years. Like, for example, video conferencing, like uh, online retail. Online retail has almost doubled in the, uh, after the lockdown. And underlying a lot of these technologies is AI. But I wouldn't say it's AI per se, it's AI plus the other things that uh, AI supports that will become part of our quote unquote new normal, as people say. Great, that's a very good point, yes. Yeah, I just, just want to quickly quickly add one thing. Uh, you know, as as for any anything, you know, for, for a golden age of anything to, to arrive, what needs to be made sure is that it's it's democratized. Uh, and, and and one of the issues that, that has come up recently, and I don't want to add uh, to, I think I agree with what, what the, uh, you know, colleagues have said, but this creates a, a huge problem in terms of the social divide that it is creating. For example, now what we have is two blocks in the world which says one block has access to all of this technology they have internet they have everything else and there is a there is this fragment of the society either in general in countries that are poor that don't have it infrastructure that don't have internet infrastructure or sections of a society within within a country so this is creating a new type of a divide um a lot of People did not have access to education or all this online education. My hometown in Kashmir, there's no internet there. People did play school. Yeah, people were not able to continue their educations online. So this has created a, a series of other issues. And unless and until there is policies to be able to solve that, I wouldn't be able to, well, I wouldn't consider something of a golden age as I write. But you know, I totally agree with Sanjay, uh, sorry, um, Ashraf, as in a golden age of need for technology for technology adoption definitely has arrived and anyway, there needs to be a big shift in policies as well as looking at how we make this globally available so that you know this can be democratized the use of this can be democratized so that there isn't a new class divide happening in the world where people have access to it and people that don't have access to it yeah great if i may also say one more thing so yeah. we are kind of bound by our experiences on many things. So, for example, I mean, people who work in computer science uh, like ourselves, I mean, working from home is not such a big problem because we can access all our machines and, and, and so forth. So people who, who take decisions need to take not just individual samples, but they need to sample the entire society because not everyone can work in the same way. We're very fortunate to, to be in this situation as computer scientists. But others are not. Great, great point, actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then there's this, uh, you know, some some related to what you know we've briefly discussed. So you know, contact tracing apps have you know become ubiquitous now, and you know there's a phrase that's being used now. It's been around for a few years called surveillance capitalism. Uh, so you know, it's basically that you know, essentially all our movements just because we have. You know, we inter interface through, through our iPhones, our phones, and smartphones, and you know, search, uh, internet. Uh, so, post pandemic, are we doomed to live in a complete surveillance state powered by AI? And as researchers, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we deal with it? Should we take a stronger stance against complete surveillance, against surveillance capitalism? Uh, you know, what is our role here? Uh, any thoughts on that? So I, I, I can quickly go ahead. I mean, um, any any kind of uh, crisis has actually, uh, you know, le le led to this as we as we know historically. You know, after nine eleven, you know, a lot of civil rights and a lot of you know a lot of you know were actually given up by people willingly. And then there was a lot of backlash, and, and and after a lot of introspection, people started realizing that this should not have happened. 
and I see I see this as no different. This is just yet another type of crisis. You know, it may not be a political crisis, health crisis, but it will have the same same impact. Uh, we we as researchers, you know, from our side, what we especially from a computer science and you know technology side, um, I, I think what our responsibility should be is to create solutions that you know draw a fine balance between. Uh, privacy, civil rights, and so on and so forth, and being able to use for the intended, uh, you know, being able to solve the intended intended use. Um, you know, again, you know, there there is going to be a politics of it. There's going to be the policy side of it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much we will be able to influence, but what we definitely can influence and should influence is to create solutions. Actually. You know, on one high, one uh, hand, solve for the problem, and at the on the other hand, also you know take into account these uh, issues of privacy and civil rights and so on and so forth, so that you know it it doesn't become a one or a zero that you know you give up one thing to get another thing, but but, but there are solutions that we can propose that uh, that can balance between the two. Yes, great. Sorry. Uh, any anybody else has? Uh, I think this is an important question. Anybody uh, wants to comment on that about surve surveillance and uh, how to uh, deal with it? I guess yeah. it's important to note that uh, what goes away never comes back. So whatever uh, uh, privacy uh, that uh, people have given up in the aftermath of 9/11 is not coming back. So it's a matter now on what else happens as a result of this uh, pandemic and how much privacy people would give up in this. It would be added, and you know. So I think uh, Faisal said it, but I'm I'm amazed by how diplomatic Faisal has been today. So. Just to give you just to give you one example of how technology can support the policy. At the, at the end of the day. Policy decisions are more important than the technology decisions. That's something to keep in mind. But technology can support uh, policy. So, for example, at QCRI, we've developed a contact tracing app. And this contact tracing app is focused on the privacy aspect of contact tracing. So, all of your uh, paths, all of your uh, motion is stored on your phone and it is only shared when somebody tests positive. So, this is an example of this balance between, you know, I'll maintain my privacy. But if the public health benefit of sharing my of, of disclosing where I've been or outweighs the the privacy concerns, I will share. Plus, we also give people the ability to edit the locations they share to remove sensitive or useless information. So technology has a role to play, but primarily this is a policy uh, uh, debate. Correct. Yes. Exactly. So may I say something? Um, yes, please. Yes. So first of all, I I don't think there is complete surveillance. So if you think about it, most of those tracking applications uh, in in many countries around the world, including here in Qatar, including in the European Union, they are volunt voluntary. Kind of you, it's your choice to install it in your phone or 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 you know or on your device and and, and be tracked and. Uh, um, well, one problem with that is kind of people, some people are scared. There's not as high adoption as people would have uh, hoped for. But I have been reading reports about cases that have been discovered through those uh, tracking apps, and they are obviously helping. So if you think about places where there's a lot of surveillance, um, for example, in China, well, I mean, there was a lot of surveillance even before the pandemic, right? So kind of the, the, the infrastructure was there. Um, and um, the way that we scientists deal with this is the way that also big companies deal with it. Um, this anonymization, this aggregation of the data, um, and, and those kinds of things are taken very seriously. Um, for example, in the European Union level with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which actually uh, uh, has implications for much of the rest of the world. And again, if you think of this Google Maps application that uh, that it has been used, this data that, that Google Maps is collecting about the mobility of people. And this is something that the QCRI is using to also to track the mobility of people in Qatar. You don't really track individual people, you track 
what is happening in general, what is happening in overall. So I don't think this is super much intruding the privacy of people, but it's still kind of informing the government decisions. Yeah. But we have to be careful. So, I mean, if, if I'm to be a little bit provocative, um, the main problem, I mean, in a way we have already given a lot of privacy uh, um, uh, on the internet in exchange for free services. And I have been watching some influential, uh, some some kind of video, very, very thought provoking in the past that was saying that, well, if you're not paying for a product, then you are the product. And we have accepted yes. that. Yes, a good point. Yeah, I think that's what they say about Google, the other products, yes. Okay, uh, I think this is the last sort of question I had. And then, you know, if there are some other questions from, from, from people attending, then we'll take them, otherwise, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess I should have a little bit alluded to that. So overall, you know, it, it, it's hard to imagine that we could have gone through this pandemic without, you know, things like YouTube or Netflix or, and of course, AI yeah, is tightly integrated as a recommendation tool at many of these entertainment service. So, uh, you know, is AI now a separable part of our existence and ultimately it's a positive technology overall. I mean, some of you have already alluded to it, but I guess you want to be more so you have, one, so have some more thoughts on that or? Can I say something about uh, a recommendation? Yeah. So recommendation, personalization, um, it's a great thing because it offers us better quality services. It can uh, make good re recommendation for us for movies in Netflix, for products to buy at Amazon, uh, for news to read. But also, it is the root of all evil when it comes to, for example, to fake news. It's only possible because of this personalization. Basically, it has allowed, uh, it has enabled advertisers, it has enabled malicious actors to micro-target people because, because of this profiling, micro-profiling that, 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 that are being built for any of us. Again, because we are the product. Um, companies, Internet giants, they know our interests, they know our location, age, income, even our political preference. And now somebody can go and buy advertisements that are specifically targeting us, that are kind of sending us an, a message that is designed to press a specific button on us. They are also creating filtering bubbles, they are creating echo chambers, um, so that, you know, if you read a little bit of something like left-leaning, and journalists have done those experiments. They would create two different accounts in social media, and in one they would follow the, the let's say, the, the web page of Hillary Clinton, and the other one of Donald Trump, and, you know, and things like that. And then they start, like, you know, getting completely different news feed, right? I mean, there was also this uh, interesting article, of, like, two years ago in New York Times, called YouTube Great Radicalizer. So basically, if you have a little bit biased, you know, video and you just leave it and kind of, it kind of automatically keeps recommending you something even more and more. And this is coupled with the model where social media are optimizing for user engagement. And, and basically they are making all this money because of the fake news and all that. Okay, I don't want to go too much into the fake news, but I'm saying a, point, yes. a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of dangers in this personalization. Yes, exactly. Personalization is, you know, it's double-edged sword. And it, I mean, also, yeah, also, also, you know, Sanjay, there is a, there is a, there is a, I think there is a line in which sometimes uh, uh, has been crossed. So the line is like, uh, uh, okay, so I know your preference and therefore I give you products that you may want or you may not want. But we also know of experiments in manipulation, right? So, so, and 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 uh, Faisal is shaking his head. So, uh, where uh, Facebook and 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 others will actually try to manipulate you into certain psychology, you know, playing with the like I don't know what you call it, psycho manipulation or something. So there are lines that you can cross, that that I think have been uh, crossed sometimes. Uh, by some of these technology companies and, uh, you know, so we have to be careful that, uh, that uh, um, to, to maintain the, the public trust, I think technology and technology companies have to behave more responsibly. 
Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So Sanjay, to just, you know, to answer the question, you know, like it or not, AI is basically mainstream. You, 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 on a daily basis, people use AI, even if they don't realize that we, we, we use AI, you know, on a, hand, on a handheld device, on a mobile phone, on their iPads, on the internet. You know, whether people realize it or not, they, they're using AI. So AI is basically mainstream. And in terms of whether it's a positive or a negative technology, you know, as Ahmed was saying, it, it depends on, on the usage and how far we, we want to go. Um, in, in fact, I was just reading one of the articles and we were talking about, you know, I'm not worried about the, the, the robots and the machines taking over the world or everything else. What I'm worried about is use of AI in modern warfare where, where humans will now use AI to, to, get, to, get, to kill other humans. So, so it, it all, all come down, comes down to responsible use of technology. Uh, overall, I think you know, uh, artificial intelligence has created new frontiers and you know things that were, were would not have been possible. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it comes to the responsible use of technology, as I was saying. Um, it, it has become mainstream. Uh, you know, we collect data on a daily basis about people, uh, about societies. So. Um, uh, the, you know, it's that it's that line that Ahmed was talking about. You know, whether we we want to cross, should cross, and how do we develop frameworks uh, around uh, what people can do and what people cannot do? Great. One comment. One comment I'd make here is that uh, as Michael is saying, AI is mainstream. AI is pervasive. AI has already transformed many uh, areas of our life. So, for example, the way we do search is different pre Google versus post Google. The way we do shopping is different pre Amazon versus post Amazon. Uh, the way we consume uh, media is different, you know, you know, pre Netflix versus post Netflix. And what's interesting about this pandemic is that up to this point, public health and health in general was not really known to be at an area where AI has made a, a big difference. And people complain about that, that, you know, how come, you know, AI has transformed the way we shop, but not the way we, we provide public health. So maybe this is an inflection point we're moving forward we'll see AI play a bigger role in public health. So for example, uh, I look forward to seeing the day where you have AI informed public health policies, uh, which kind of we, we alluded to earlier in the, in the panel. Right. So this is my comment that, you know, it's not about AI, it's just about AI is now entering into uh, public health. Yes. So there are a few comments in the, in the, from the, from, from the, uh, in the question and answer box. So let me just read them out. So once, uh, this is our own uh, Abdul Qadir Bagar, he's saying the concept of AI should be used carefully. It is an enabler, but not yet the solution. It'll augment our intelligence through intelligent infrastructure that allows accurate search and data mining. Still, the main challenge is whether the AI agent is able to make decisions, predictions with high accuracy. That's one comment from him. Uh, yeah, I think if, uh, just maybe quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Something about this. So, uh, we have been talking about, uh, I mean, it, it's a lot about terminology. Um, so, AI, we, we are we are in the in the in the most recent hype of AI. AI has been going up and down. They had been like several winters. I mean, let's go to the Outback report, you know, in the sixties, and then there was another one in the seventies, you know, said back in the UK, you know, and, and so on and so forth. There, there was something in the eighties, the crisis of the expert systems, and so on and so forth. So, kind of. Saying that you work on AI was not always so cool as it is today, right? Yeah. But now it's a little bit too cool. So now you start like seeing every single company, you know, saying, oh, we are, I don't know, X AI, we are Y AI, and, and, and all these kinds of things. At the end of the day, it's not really this AI that you see in Terminator movies and so on. It's more like machine learning, right? And 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 uh, we and this is based on data. Okay, and actually, there's a way to tell. Uh, there's this nice joke about how to tell whether something is AI or something is machine learning. Well, if it's made if it's in Python, it's machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's AI, right? So, so, um, and 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 it. I mean, we have to be a little bit careful about the terminology, and and then it all goes to data, right? So. It's, we have now the models, we have now the, the computational power, and you have the data. And this combination, you know, is something that, that enables us to do a lot of smart things. But then we have to also be careful 
about the future of AI is that there's a limit of how much you can do without much theory, just with simple statistics and simple neural nets, right, uh, out of this data. And there has been like a famous criticism a couple of years ago by Chomsky and so on saying, you know, guys, we have to get some theory, need some kind of, you know, deeper understanding, not just, you know, kind of those uh, superficial models. So I think that, you know, the future of AI is going into developing more powerful theories. Uh, there's a limit of how much you can get with huge data. At the end of the day, you want to learn also with limited data. And this is something that is going to be especially important in case like pandemic. So in the beginning, you have very limited data, how much you can get you know, from this. Now, there has been a lot of research in natural language processing, also in image processing, of repurposing pre-trained models. So for example, in, in, in image processing, there's ImageNet. In uh, natural language processing, there's BERT. Those are pre-trained, huge uh, networks that you can easily fine tune and adapt to a new problem. And this is something that it has come uh, quite quite useful. Okay, uh, maybe just uh, let's quickly go through any final comments that people have, and then we'll uh, you know wrap up. Any any comments, Doctor Emma? Do you have any co final comments? Well, I want to make sure that uh, that uh, uh, um, um, my parting comments would be. Uh, uh, of course, again, to thank uh, everybody. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Amina for really uh, doing all behind the scenes uh, work and making sure uh, that uh, the technology worked and uh, and doing all the publicity and and all all you know all the behind the scenes work. And thank you very much, Amina. And uh, I want to thank Ashraf because. Uh, when we first started, you know, at QCRI, we we're actually pretty shrewd. So when we first decided that we we're going to focus on uh, uh, COVID and try to make some contributions within COVID, we knew that we can't let a herd of cats go at it. So uh, early on, from day one or I think maybe day two, we asked Ashraf to be in charge of coordinating and being the focal point of, of our COVID activities. So uh, thanks very much, Ashraf, for doing this and, and doing a great uh, job. And uh, Mukbil also for making sure that uh, when we decided and committed to do an application or to do some software development, that then Mukbil, our chief scientist, was there overnight over the weekend. And we, you know, we were calling them at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., making sure that this app is working and, and that app is working and so on. And finally, without saying that Sanjay for having thought of this uh, lecture series and, and he's the intellectual power uh, behind uh, uh, QCRI. He's a very uh, uh, pen, uh, pensive and, and intel intellectual person. The other thing that I wanted to say quickly is that in QCRI, we, were, we had the foresight of knowing uh, uh, the important things that will become. So health is a mega project that was identified a few years ago and that Faisal leads. Fake news is also another mega project that is led by uh, Preslav. And I think uh, if anything, this shows that we knew what was going to be important before it became important. And, and um, thirdly, uh, in fact, uh, uh, elevating artificial intelligence into a center and saying QCI, the Qatar, uh, the Qatar Center for Artificial Intelligence, and developing the AI national strategy for Qatar uh, is very important. And it showed uh, uh, the foresight of uh, this uh, uh, group of computer scientists that uh, we have. Very last uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard or not, but uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Maryam Murad was elected to the National Academy of Science. She's an, Amer an Algerian American that uh, works at uh, Mount Sinai, and she works on these very questions that are very perplexing. Why is it that 95% of the cases in Qatar are mild or non-symptomatic, and there is 1% of the cases that is very uh, grave? Where in other countries, the percentages are different. Why is it that people react differently to the virus? Uh, and so on. So she's an expert in in these types of questions that I can't even uh, pronounce. But uh, she was elected to the National Academy of Science, and we're very proud as uh, as uh, 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 of her as an Arab 
uh, American uh, scientists. Finally, Dr. Monsof Slawi, who is a member of the Board of Trustees for HBKU, was uh, appointed uh, this week by uh, President Trump to lead the U.S. effort in uh, developing a vaccine. Uh, Dr. Monsof Slawi is a Moroccan American and uh, has been with us many, many times. We met him, he's visited the QCRI, and uh, he's a uh, leading uh, scientist and technologist uh, and entrepreneur. And, and uh, these are examples of uh, people that uh, we are very proud of and we consider to be uh, role models. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ashraf, do you wanna have some closing comments or? Uh, I just want to add to the thank yous that uh, Ahmed mentioned to thank all of the scientists and engineers at QCRI for all the work they've done. We're just presenting the work, but uh, the real heavy lifting was done by them. And I wish everybody uh, happy holidays and happy Eid and uh, stay safe. Great. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Tezel, uh, any final comments? He uh, can't top that. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. <laughs> no, th no, no, I, I, I do, I do want to thank um, all the organizers, but at, at, at the same time, I want to thank all the participants. Um, uh, you know that, that I think uh, Ahmed in the very beginning mentioned that the attendances for all of these lectures has been has been phenomenal, and um, you know that that's that's what leads leads to the, to the success, and 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 we we hope that the, you know all of these. Uh, all of these lectures have been have been useful, and 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 in terms of you know spurring new kind of research and spurring new kind of thought, not not just within the research community, within the student community as well as in in the society uh, in Qatar uh, in general. So so thank you for uh, all for uh, for attending um, all of these talks. Great, and Kareem, and and then Tesla, do you want to say something? So, um, um, I mean, I'm not going to top all the thanks as Dr. Ahmed said. <laughs> I just want to put uh, one part in comment. Uh, I mean, when we deal with AI, AI is as good as the data that we put in. If our data is garbage or has fundamental flaws like, uh, like extreme biases and so forth, then the systems are going to be as biased as the data that we put in. It's going to be as bad or as good as the data we put in. And the other thing, when we deal with AI also, and I mean, there's there's support of, of expectations on the part of the people who actually are on the receiving end of the technology. People think that, oh, it's AI, so it has to be perfect. By definition, AI is not perfect. And people need to under, kind of understand this intuition that, you know, the model is 70% or 80% accurate. I know people, you know, layman's may not understand what 70 or 80% mean, but we need to bring this to a point where people kind of uh, have realistic expectations about what this AI can do. And Preslav, uh, final comments or? So yeah, uh, I would like to thank as well for the uh, opportunity to, to present our work, uh, to take part uh, in this debate, uh, but really to have this great opportunity to learn. Um, and, um, I think that there, there, there are two more points. One is that the pandemic has created a lot of challenges, but also offers a lot of opportunities. And we need to think about democratizing data availability, because this is more important these days than the underlying algorithms. The access to data is critical. Um, and this also goes to the democratization of the knowledge. Um, so for example, um, because of the traveling restrictions in many countries, this year something very, very remarkable could not happen, take place. The iClear, which is the Inform International Conference in Learning Representations, which is a leading uh, artificial intelligence conference, was supposed to take place in Addis Ababa in Africa because people started worrying about that some regions are underrepresented, people cannot really travel in some cases for visa restrictions in other cases for you know, financial reasons and so on. Unfortunately, this could not happen. The conference had to go fully online. And guess what? It was a huge success. It was a huge success. Everybody, every other conference these days is looking into them what they have done. And this was achieved with technology, with including with AI technology. 
and um, they have actually effectively doubled the number of participants compared to, to last year. Um, and finally, I want to talk about, I think that, that this lecture ser series has been a huge educational experience. And I believe that, um, again, I'm, I'm looking from my perspective of, of fighting the fake news, right? This has been a lot of disinformation. It has been a, uh, the, the first global infodemic. And to me, the best way to fight it is through education. And I, I hope that this lecture series have contributed to this. And finally, I mean, I have seen this media medium blog post some time ago that really, really made me think about it. It was called Flattening the Curve for Armchair Epidemiology. So the problem is that these days there are so many people, you know, that don't really have the right background, right? That are kind of jumping into this field. And this is where our responsibility of scientists is to try to educate them in the areas where we are specialists in. Right, so that they kind of get a deeper understanding, and hopefully this is going to to help the the, the public debate. Is is kind of get to better understanding to, to the general public. Great. Okay. Thank everybody else, and and I think I, I hope everybody enjoyed these lecture series, and the the videos will be online and uh, on YouTube and on the HPKU YouTube channel. And finally, again, I want to thank Amina and Lawrence for really putting this thing behind behind the scenes. So um, hopefully, uh, people will you know have a chance to look at the videos and learn from it. And please send us comments. So again, thank you very much, and happy Eid. <laughs>